Back in 1962, there was a preacher and teacher and author named Ernest Campbell, and he preached a sermon called Locked in a Room with Open Doors. So right off the bat, I'm confessing, I'm stealing his title, but I'm giving him his props. And I'm using the title for us in 2015 with a completely different text. And the text is the 20th chapter of John. It's the events that happened on the night of Easter morning. Now, Dr. Campbell began his sermon with a, a very brief story that went like this. He said, I knew a family that had two brothers and the younger brother had a terrible fear of open doors. So the older brother, just to needle him, would threaten him from time to time, someday I'm gonna lock you in a room with open doors. Here now from the 20th chapter of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace, be with you. After he said this, he showed him his hands and his feet, his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'm, I'm standing out here and, and they're in there. I see they're all in there. I, can, I think they boarded up the windows with cardboard or something and there's a little sliver I can kind of see that they're all in there, but well, Thomas is missing. But they're in there kind of in a huddle. I think I'm going to go in and find out what their thoughts are on what happened this morning. Yeah, except they seem to have locked the doors from, from inside. Why would they do that? Wouldn't you think they'd be out and about sharing the good news of what's happened instead of in there, in, in kind of in their panic room? This reminds me of something that happened years ago when our kids were little. Murray, my husband, and I took our two younger kids along with my older brother Wade, his wife Sharon, and their two young kids, and we went to the Philadelphia Zoo on a beautiful afternoon in September, nice and cool and crisp. Now my older brother Wade is six foot five, and he has a shocker copper red hair, and he has the family nose, and he has bright blue eyes. So the, the entire family decided on a little field trip that I didn't want any part of, because I'm not that into reptiles. So they were going over to the reptile house. So in the meantime, I, I passed on that. And I just took the chance to walk around by myself at the zoo in a kind of meditative sort of state, just to see where my feet might lead me. And as I was walking around, I, I spied this tall, red-haired man. And I thought, oh, OK. So I walked over stood next to him in sisterly, companionable way, kind of leaned against him at the rail. Didn't really look at him because I was, I was looking at the exhibit in front of him, and it was the bear exhibit. Now, you know that zoos have moved from the confined cages to the more open habitats for the animals so they can enjoy more space and freedom. So as I'm watching, there's some young bears. You don't have to work with me on this, all right? Some young bears and they're strutting around, being young bears, just enjoying being bears, enjoying the open habitat. And then back at the back and the left, there was another bear. He was an old bear. He was, a, he was a mangy bear. He had some tufts of hair come out and bald patches, and even from a distance, I could tell he was looking kind of funny out of his eyes. And he was doing this. I'm not getting down on all fours. I'm going to get back up. He's doing this.
You know, I think about my life at every phase. <laughs> every phase, I've been pacing a cage with no bars. It didn't seem like it at the time, but that's what I've been doing. I think back to the late 70s, and I'm sitting there at Page Memorial United Methodist Church in Aberdeen, North Carolina, right near Gulf Country, Pinehurst. I'm sitting there, fanning myself with a funeral fan. I'm 21 years old, and I am the Duke Summer Student Intern, about to go off to Duke Divinity School in the fall to learn how to preach. Not a good chronology to start preaching before you learn, but it is what it is. So I'm sitting there. I had this call to ministry in high school, and I said, what? For one thing, I'm a girl in the 70s. For another, what? I'm shy. And so I paced this cage of insecurity and anxiety, and as I sat up there at the church about to give my first sermon, I looked out at the congregation, kind of like, help me. <laughs> but I looked out and I thought to myself, Mr. Hinson, you're a pharmacist and you're 45 years old, come up here and help me out. Ms. Davis, you're a reading specialist, you're in your 50s, you look very wise, come on up here and give me some help. Because all I knew how to do was to work up a little Bible lesson, and then I would read it, and when people started to look bored, I'd just toss out a story, which might or might not be related to the little Bible lesson. <laughs> so, in retrospect, this theory of preaching is called Marching Them Through Siberia, with periodic stops to hand out Snickers bars. And I paced this cage of anxiety. And, and finally, I thank God that Christ came in, Christ came in and said, peace, be still, and said, I know you got doubts, and I know this wasn't your idea, but come on out, and let's see where this may lead us, and I'll be with you. Then fast forward, I was 25 years old, and I'm appointed to my first pastoral appointment after seminary, Aldersgate United Methodist Church in York, Pennsylvania. And in the congregation, there is this handsome young man with uh, dark hair. He's still handsome. He's here this morning. I turned his hair a little different color through the years. Full responsibility for that. But his name is Murray McKenzie, and he had full custody of an adorable little three-year-old girl named Melissa. Now, the ladies of the church... The ladies of the church reasoned that, okay, here's this man with this cute little girl, here's this new pastor, and she's female. So it stands to reason that she will be a fabulous mother. Can I get an amen? <laughs> of course. And so we, we were put on committees together. They tried to match us up. Nobody, it didn't work out. Finally, they put us on a committee with four other people who mysteriously, simultaneously dropped off, leaving us a committee of two for the past 35 years. So then, newlywed, right? And, and we all know newlywed is total bliss. New relationships, you're in love, it's exciting. But then I began to pace this cage. Do you remember the old song, um, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden? So I began pacing this cage of false expectations. And I began having turmoil of emotions. And finally, my friends, I do hope this won't make you think less of me, but finally I realized that I was suffering from jealousy of a three-year-old girl in that relationship. I thank God that Jesus came in as I paced that cage and, and said to me, peace to all those jealous feelings, peace. You're 25 years old. You have your ambitions, you have your agenda but can you open your heart and be a mother to a three-year-old girl? See, this is called call and response. Blessings on this beautiful baby. <laughs> he could stay if he wants, he's adorable. Can you open your heart to this little three-year-old girl? I thank God that Jesus came in and called me out. And then I came to Perkins in 2000, a new job, and you know, all they want is everything, right? You're supposed to write a lot, you're supposed to be on a lot of committees, you're supposed to do a lot of outside speaking, and also supposed to have fabulous teaching evaluations. And so I start pacing this cage, I don't know what you want to call it, maybe like professional anxiety, am I doing enough, am I moving ahead enough, am I, is it enough, is it good enough? Pacing back and forth. 
And I thank God that, that Christ came into that cage and said, hey, you know what? How about you focus on the glorious vocation of teaching? How about you look your students in the eye and you focus on them and forget all that other stuff? Peace be still to all that anxious stuff. And I'll see you through. I thank God for that. And most recently, I started seeing a spiritual director, which I probably should have done a long time ago. But a spiritual director, it's not like therapy exactly. It is more like meeting with a wise, prayerful person who tells you where, helps you think about where is God at work in my life. And she pointed out, she said, Alice, you suffer from the temptation of the good. It's like, oh, this would be good to do, and oh, that's good too, and oh, that's important too, and oh, my priorities are everything. Yeah? She said, you need to practice. I'll let you help me practice this. It won't take long. You have to participate though, okay? She said, you need to practice saying a two-letter word. N no. Try again, that wasn't very, very convincing. No. Let God into your nose so that you can be a good steward of your body, you know, your energy, your emotions. So when your yes is yes, it's really yes. And also, how about the fact that you are not the only person in the universe who can do what they've asked you to do. Somebody else could do an even better job. Give them the chance. I thank God for the wisdom of Christ that came through this wise Roman Catholic laywoman. I thank God that Christ comes in to my cage and calls me out. And so I ask you this morning, what cage are you pacing? What cage are you pacing in there, in that upper room with the disciples, with me? I thank God that this morning, God calls all of us out. Christ calls all of us out to go to the places where people are really locked in some rooms with some pretty thick walls, some pretty heavy doors with some pretty rusty hinges. Maybe you have been there, are there, loved ones are there. How about, how about that room of addiction? Or maybe you're afraid, afraid for your own life at your own hands. Or maybe you stand helplessly by while your loved one flunks out of rehab for the fifth time, count them five. Or maybe, locked in a room of an abusive relationship that you have to work hard to keep a secret. Or maybe locked in a room of a disability or a mental deterioration and you sit across from your elderly or maybe not elderly loved one who does not recognize you anymore. And you pray, dear God, I pray, I hope that Jesus Christ has wrapped my loved one's mind in love and lives, lives within her heart. There are walls of loneliness, there are walls of discrimination where people face prejudice on the basis of race and sexual orientation and gender. There are a lot of places where people are locked in. Heavy doors, rusty hinges, thick walls. And, and who can break them out? Well, as luck would have it, he's standing right there. He's standing right over there. Have you ever seen the picture called Christ at Heart's Door? Anybody ever seen that by Warner Salman, Christian artist? Now, I have to say that, that he does not look anything like that picture. For one thing, he does not have shoulder-length auburn hair. For another, he does not have lily white skin like in the picture. And for another, he does not look patient. Now I know that it is dangerous for me to put words in the mouth of our Lord, so I'm just going to do a little riff. And if you think it's irreverent, forgive me. But if I were standing there looking in, I might be thinking something like this. How is what you all are doing in there in any way following the, the instructions that I or an angelic messenger gave you upon finding the empty tomb, I do not recall saying, go, go and find a safe house. And within that safe house, find a panic room and lock yourselves in it for an indefinite period of time. I don't recall saying that. 
And I know about Revelation 3.20 where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door to me, I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. I know about that, but you know what? I do not have time to stand here indefinitely and watch you pace your cages. I'm coming in. And, and now I see. He's not there anymore, he's there. And you should see the expression on the disciples' faces. The closest thing I can think of it, to it, is sometimes on Fridays, I go to my little grandson, who is totally adorable, by the way, my little grandson's daycare. And I stand, you know how they have the half door? The top half is open. I stand at the top half and I look in until he sees me. And my, my glamorous grandmother name is Gigi. <laughs> he sees me at the door and his little face lights up like the sun. And I know what he's thinking in his little, little toddler brain. He's like, she's breaking me out. <laughs> Their faces look like that. Because what an entrance, what an entrance. Where do you think that, that Jesus learned to make an entrance like this? Maybe from his father, maybe from his father. In many ways, on many days in the Old Testament, God broke people out. How about Joseph in the pit? How about Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the furnace? How about Daniel in the lion's den? How about the Israelites walking through the sea? Not drowned, but free. How about when Jesus stands at the edge of Lazarus' tomb, and, and Lazarus, in the uh, old-time uh, King James Version, it says, Behold, he stinketh. And Jesus calls out, Lazarus, come out. How about breaking Paul and Silas out of jail with an earthquake? And how about, how about as Jesus hangs on the cross trapped in pain, God, God breaks people out. And my friends, the good news is that today it's your turn. Today it's your turn. Jesus has located your safe house and has breached your panic room and stands before you in your apartment, in your office, in your cubicle, in your break room, in your classroom, in your bedroom, in your kitchen. Anybody have a storage unit? In your storage unit, Jesus breaks through and stands before you. So lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes from your pain, from your guilt over what's gone on before, from your loneliness and behold your savior who stands before you. With a greeting, with a greeting. Not, how you doing? Not, oh, you're anxious, I hope things will go better for you. You know, you could try positive thinking. That could be helpful. But a greeting that is not a wish, but a statement of fact. Peace be with you, because I'm peace in person. Peace in person. Peace be still. Peace be with you. What an entrance. What a greeting, and what a gift. A gift? that can only come from one who is one with us in our suffering. He shows us his hands and his side, a gift that can only come from one who is one with God in power and in presence. He passes through walls and he stands before us, offering us forgiveness. What a gift from one who on a Friday not long ago, well, he was bullied to death, like the boy in McKinney. On a Friday, not long ago, he was tased face down on the pavement, though he had no weapon. On a Friday, not long ago, he was sexually humiliated. Because I don't know what else you call it when somebody is stripped naked and beaten in front of a crowd. On a Friday, not long ago, he was, well, he was torn up and he was nailed up and he was torn down. This is the one, this is the one. Well, he said he was leaving. He said he'd be back. Today he's back, he's back. To breathe upon us the Holy Spirit, 
And I don't know, friends, how much good news you can take in, in one dose, but he's here to say that now my presence is personal, personal. Now my presence is pervasive, and now my presence is permanent among you, my followers. Whatever you face ahead of you outside your panic room. What an entrance, what a greeting, what a gift, and now, my friends, what an exit. Because after he breathes on us the Holy Spirit, he says, as my Father has sent me, so I send you. So it is time for us to leave the panic room. It's time for us to, to follow our risen Lord wherever he's going next, which we can bet is to those rooms in the world where God's beloved children are locked in with thick walls, heavy doors, rusty hinges by addiction and violence and prejudice. So I don't know how long I stood there, just kind of mesmerized, you know. It is mesmerizing. To keep counting to five. But eventually I, I, I nudged the man next to me and I, I pointed to the bear and I said, I said, you know, he reminds me of me. And at that point, I looked up into his face. Oops. Right height, right hair color, mm, wrong nose, and green eyes. Still, he grinned, and he said, Yeah, he says, I, I know what you mean. Don't you kind of wonder when he's ever going to stop? <laughs> 